Thank you very much, Andrew. And uh, I'd like to start by thanking Andrew and Toby, John, Leah, and the, the whole crew here at Queensland Conservatory of Music um, for putting on this conference. It's been fantastic. Um, and it's a real honour to be here and talk to this particular audience. I was at the first nine conference uh, in Dublin many years ago and attended the first ten conferences without a break. I've had a few years off and been back in the last three and it continues to amaze me how this community reinvents itself, is inc incredibly innovative and continues to push forward those boundaries. I love the fact that the nine conference is a single stream conference and that we all get to share ideas I love the fact that the demo sessions demonstrate as much mad scientists as they do the explorations of sophisticated evaluation processes, and that in the concerts we really highlight the exploration and evolution of musical language and practice. That's a unique thing to this conference, I think. So today I want to talk about this question, musical uh, expression <coughs> and new interfaces. This is, after all, the title of this conference. Of course, I'm playing around here a little bit with our, our programming uh, approaches to uh, equals, not equals, comparators, etc., etc., and just kind of throwing this out into the mix. I'd say that the Nine community, from my uh, experience, is um, characterised by innovation. There's certainly more than three de decades of such activity, and we can think back to people that we've unfortunately lost, like David Wessel and Michelle Weisbich in recent years, and think about long practices of performance. We can also think in Australia about uh, companies such as Fairlight, who innovated the whole musical workstation area, and in fact, some of the earliest um, three-dimensional video tracking in the three-disc system. So this experimentation, this kind of mad scientist approach that many of us are engaged in the maker community, is often, in my view, an exploration of potential. What's the future of music? And that is often expressed here as a uniquely personalised um, kind of expression. It's flexible. We're often looking to make these applications as dynamic as possible to fit a broad range of contexts and new <coughs> genres. And we cross over all the time between system control and real-time performance. Um, and in reviewing the literature, I ask myself often how musical expression is situated in the discourse that we have, and in what ways does the development of new interfaces support that exploration and that extension of musical expression. <coughs> so I'm hoping to touch on all of these matters in, in my talk today. Um, this is, of course, a very <coughs> an ambitious plan. The space is, and we have to start here by addressing the fact that the space, the problem space we're working is incredibly complex, right, when we're trying to do evaluations. We're looking at gesture and sonification. We're looking at the ways in which that develops a morphology between those relationships. This is, of course, a multi-dimensional control space. So what is the dimensionality of that? And of course, then we have to think about the fact that that dimensionality has to be cognitively manageable. Right? We need to be able to manage that space if it's going to be of use to us. There are usually multiple time horizons. We're usually thinking about continuation or continuums of development and events simultaneously. And, and we need to think about the percentage of distribution of those things. And those of you who saw me perform the other night will have seen me use the parallax, which I think does a lot of these things very well. And I have it here, so if you're interested in looking at the instrument afterwards, please do. I often ask myself, whether we're really looking for a revolution of musical practice, which is often a desire for many of us, or whether in fact an evolution is a more useful, long-term, and more productive approach. I'm very interested in the somatic relationship to the instrument and the interface, and I'll talk a little at the end of the talk about a proposal for a technosomatic dimension as a design space or not. <coughs> And I'm also interested in how we as a community think about generalizable models of design and comparators so that we can actually evaluate the design potentials, evaluate the musical interfaces, and move forward as a community as a whole. Of course, some work has been done in these areas. We've heard some of it here at the conference, and I point here to a paper from 2005, which many of you will know, which did exactly this, which was to look at um, to apply HCI techniques to look at this multi-dimensional space, not as a control space, but actually as a musical performance space. And so uh, what I'm trying to say here is that we need to acknowledge that it's a very large dimensional problem, 
and that we need to evaluate it in a way that addresses front and centre the richness of activity of music making itself. It's not, in my view, a technical problem. So, I think about this all the time as an n-dimensional vector field, right? It's, it's a vast. We come away from a performance work not <coughs> thinking about a particular point of the work, but, but having a sensation, a kind of just doubt of the work as a whole. And we understand the work as a whole, not, as, not a, in terms of each of its parts, usually. So I, I just want to give you a position statement here about new interfaces. So new interfaces for musical expression must speak to the nature of instrument. That is, it must always be understood that the interface binds to a complex musical phenomena. We need to focus on exploring the nature of that engagement. The point of performance that occurs when a human being engages with a computer-based instrument, usually for us computer-based. And it's important because due to the obs obs sorry, obscuration that occurs when we're basically using a chameleon child of the Industrial Revolution as a musical instrument. We need to keep asking focused questions about the nature of instrument in computer music, and I believe we need to evolve some conceptual models for mapping of gesture to sonic outcomes within a music and slash instrument context that can be generalizable and are not driven by engineering and technical thinking. <coughs> technical constraints, which we're all deeply engaged with, of course, are, and, and considerations are actually only one of many, many levels of complex manifold that make up the act of music. So then I often also enjoy a little bit of, kind of etymology of thinking through well, what are the words we're using, what do they mean, and are they the right words? So mapping we use all the time. What if we think about navigation? If the mapping's dynamic, for instance, if it's highly dimensional, then perhaps we're navigating that space. Much discourse has gone on around navigating or interpolating preset spaces, for instance. How do we navigate large dimensional spaces? Are they really potentialities or pools of potentials that we're navigating rather than states? How might we move away from the idea of state machines, for instance? Uh, is it interactive, in fact, or is it responsive? What potential is there, in, for instance, in the system for surprise? And um, some years ago, I published a paper in Organised Sound called Interactivity, Where To From Here, where I proposed a conversational model for interaction. And the point was, that in a conversation we start from a known place. We both agree to speak the same language and you know, we have a set of rules that are agreed upon. However, we don't know where that conversation is going to go, how it's going to unfold, and what the content of it is in advance. But the rule set allows us to engage in that activity. Are we creating the content in real time or are we controlling a system of playback? Where does the agency sit in that creation phase? Is it actually always conscious and what degree of it is unconscious? How is that an embodied expression of music making? And then gesture and feedback, there's lots of discussion about haptics, but obviously the sound is incredibly important. The physicality of, of somatic engagement with the interface is incredibly important and I'll come to talk about these a little later. I like to frame that thinking in my own head by Merleau-Ponty and, and in fact on Eads more recent writings about embodied relations. And embodied relations being a set of unique relationships with technology that facilitate an embodied engagement with the world that could not occur without the technology. So a musical instrument is such a piece of technology and without it we couldn't make music, right? We have in fact embodied relations with a musical instrument. <coughs> The key is that the technology in embodied relations becomes invisible. So examples of this are a walking stick, reading glasses that many of us are wearing in here and so on, that we access the world through this technology but we're not conscious of doing so at the time. And this applies in my view extremely well in the nine community. Now the car laps that I used the other night and is here, I like um, a lot because it embodies many of these things and I think it does so because the design intention came from that angle. Here's their concept statement which is the Carlax has been designed to offer artists a large and diverse range of control. Carlax captures all the gestures from the most sensitive to the wildest combining expressivity and intuitive intuitiveness. 
The movement of fingers, wrists, elbows, forearms, torso and whole body are captured, analysed and sent wirelessly to the computer running the artistic intentions of the performer and composer. And those of you who saw me gesturing with it the other day will agree that it was on the wireless side of that range. <clears throat> um, now, one of the interesting things around the work that they've been doing here and that's been occurring around the Carlax is the development of pedagogy. And I'm going to suggest that, in fact, idiomatic approaches, um, the suggestion of constraints and so on, are extremely important in terms of sharing musical languages, musical literature, and so on. And this work has, of course, been, been done by Tom Mays and so on in terms of notation systems for the Carlax and by others such as Philip Geis and Andrew Stewart, <coughs> who's also here. So there's a, there's a growing body of shared literature about ways of documenting and sharing knowledge about performance. Indeed, I used a uh, modular setup in my concert the other night too. Half of my modular setup is this shared systems, make noise shared system system, and it's called the shared system. Um, there are a number of albums produced on the shared system. There are lots of tutorials, lots of shared patches. Again, a community of practitioners sharing things. Of course, those of us in the Max, PD, Superclo, etc. communities are quite used to this, but we're not so used to it in terms of hardware communities. Um, and so this is, you know, half my setup because it brings me into a community of discourse that I think is really important. And I'm going to argue <coughs> later on that these idiomatic approaches actually build in a certain amount <coughs> of robustness in terms of community uptake. Um, so, <coughs> mapping, of course, we can't get away from mapping. <laughs> and so I want to just start by talking very briefly about that. And I want to just demonstrate, show you or share with you a little bit of my own work because many of you will not, not know my work. Um, so I generally engage with electroacoustic composition and real-time performance. I've built several installations. Some of you may have seen my singing bowl robots at night last year. And I also have written, as Andrew said, a number of works for interactive dance performance using video tracking way back at the very nervous system hardware stage of things. Um, through to um, biosensing and so on. Now what's really interesting about the dance works are two things that I think apply here in this discussion. One is the body is dynamic. So we already have a dynamic system at the centre of the production of the work, which is, in my view, really interesting. I remember Kia Ung, who's at Leeds University in the UK, saying to me once that cows were much easier to track than humans because they didn't change their form. And I thought that was a good point. Right? We have a very dynamic system there. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting about this is that the mappings are usually <coughs> hidden. In other words, because we have a dynamic system in the dancer, it's usually not easy to understand what those mapping processes are. You can't necessarily read them. So here's an early work from the late 90s that I did with Company in Space. This is a telepresence work called Incarnate. And in this is a performance rehearsal recording where we have a dancer in Australia, one in Hong Kong. And I'll just play it for you. It's kind of like, well, what, what's driving that? All of the music is produced in real time. Well, what's driving that is the thinking about second and third, third order derivatives of activity over time. The acceleration, the continuation of movement of the head, how much movement of the head there is. And in this case, because the work is about being in somebody else's mind, somebody else's body from a distance, there are questions about correlation of the two image strengths. How much are they inside each other's head and so on? How much are they inhabiting each other's worlds, if you like? 
And then, of course, there's height and acceleration and things like that. But the idea that we're going into higher order derivatives in order to get temporal form is something that I wanted to kind of put here. Um, here's a work that actually I did just last week, um, again in, in Adelaide, and it's a work called um, Crosstalk, and in this work, um, the dancers describe each other, the language is written in real time up into a three-dimensional space that belongs to them, and then as they dance, they collide with that text, and as the text cross over, they rewrite themselves. The piece is essentially about how language and interaction makes society, makes us, makes culture, and so on. And so in this work, which is essentially about autopoesis, they make each other and the system throughout the duration of the performance. So let me just play you a tiny bit of that. These are all their word streams being strung together to display for everyone. They're still speaking words and issuing vocal commands. just a performance video, I mean, sorry, a rehearsal video. Um, and again, you can see two things going on here. Direct commands, vocal commands, but also, again, longer correlation analysis of um, temporal structures in the stage being transported, if you like, or, or interpreted into the dance, the sonification processes. So this is a constant struggle, is how do we think about making form over time from complex data space and not just make kind of momentary or state-based decisions where we jump from one state to another? How does this evolve and how do these actions within the system generate these longer structures? Um, okay, and then I'm gonna show you one more. This is a piece I made with Helen Skye in 2008. Um, it's called Dark Wedge of Night, and it uses biosensors on the body. Now, in this case, we have an accelerometer on the right hand, on a finger, an accelerometer on the left shoulder. So this hand is obviously quite separate, separate from the rest of the body, or can be. The torso is obviously related to the shoulder. And then we have muscle sensing on the arm, brain, and head <coughs> sensing, um, and so on. So let me just play you this. This is the beginning of the work, and it's per demonstrating the system. And you can see there that she has quite fine control over what's going on, and um, and I was talking to somebody last night about the fact that when we ran a season of this performance work for 10 days, <coughs> we actually, on every second night, went out on stage before the performance and told people, showed them the census, told them what was going on. Every other night, we didn't tell them anything. And then we provided drinks and food afterwards and went around and discussed with people, told them what was going on and discussed that with them. What was interesting to us is that every single person either said, oh, I wish you'd told me that before the performance, that would have made it so much more impactful, or said, that was really fantastic that you told us that before the performance. We didn't tell them much technical detail, we just showed them that these things were there and that the data was real time and that was driving the work. That was all we were trying to share with them. Um, okay, so, so one might argue that all of these mappings are essentially arbitrary, that I've just made up a set of mappings that work. And so then it's interesting, I think, to ask, well, in what ways are they arbitrary? Are they, in fact, informed by enculturation, by performance practice, etc.? Does enculturation or our cultural practices produce intuitive relationships? Do we understand something from a history of music making in our society? And then, in that case, how do we seek generalised model models and why does it matter anyway? I think it matters because we want, as a community, to move from experimentation to repeatability to things that are robust and measurable to applications in the, in the broader world. And I think we should because the, the value that's in this community is extraordinary and the, the creativity that's here is extraordinary and the value to that beyond this community is also, in my view, extraordinary. Who's doing this? Well, loads of people are doing this, right? 
And in my original slide, there were loads of other interfaces. It's been going along, on a long time. Marco has just, of course, run a Kickstarter campaign, which quite possibly many of you contributed to. Um, the the emojis are here. You know, I also joined the Kickstarter. Fantastic, great exploration. Um, the old motion synth and so on and so forth. We could all name many more than this. But here we are, many of us starting to think about commercialising these products and taking them out into a broader user community. So it's important in my view to transfer this domain knowledge. And here's just a couple of quick examples of ways in which I've done that in recent years. This is a music therapy system for the Nord Nordoff Robbins um, music therapy. This is about developing a communicative link between a therapist and a patient. This is a really difficult problem because, for a whole range of reasons, obviously, but also because the therapists don't have technical skills. They're like, well, I just need to set this camera up and it has to work. So it needs to auto map, it needs to auto adjust to light, it needs to understand its context straight away, and they don't need to have any technical knowledge to operate it. That, as we <coughs> know, is already a difficult challenge. It also needs to be intuitive and simple to use. Another example is a um, project that I did at Westmead Children's Hospital with PhD student Samantha Hewitt when I was at the University of Western Sydney. And this project was for long stay adolescents in the hospital. And. <laughs> See, we're using the audio cubes. Um, Ableton and both that we wrote to do some visualisation. The project had to be able to be used by an individual and a group. similar kinds of work into that community. And then of course we're asked, well how do we validate these outcomes and how do we measure the value of this kind of music making and so on. Obviously they enjoy themselves and there are lots of ways of just saying right at the beginning, well they're smiling and they're laughing so that's good. Um, but then when we come to evaluation, you know, we have to ask ourselves, well what models do we adopt? How do we understand the complexity of the domain in developing appropriate evaluation tools? Because the tools are not necessarily those of chai or of science or humanities and so on, right? These are the models that we're often just taking and using. But they don't necessarily give us a full answer to the complexity of the space in which we're working. And I think it's important for us to find our own models, our own models of evaluation and comparison. And I think it's critical because we need to be able to do comparative design analysis. We need to understand more about where the community of the whole, as a whole is going and learn from each other in quite focused ways. Now when I'm thinking about this, I like to come back to Donald Norman, and he has three levels of processing in the human brain and associated modes of experience that he outlines here. They're, he says they're inclusive considerations of a musical experience from a variety of points of view. So you can see here the first of these three levels is visceral. It's an automatic and pre-wired reaction to stimuli. Automatic, as he says. I also think this is at the subtle body, the somatic level of engagement. He talks about behavioural mode involved in subconscious control of learning of everyday activities, driving a car, a car and of course playing an instrument once you've, you've learnt it, right? And reflective, the high order, the high level conscious thought in which we form opinions, plans and of course in musical context start to think about form, especially improvisation, 
um, and so on. So Donald Norman says that good design requires a balanced appeal on all three levels. It is also clear that all three levels are in fact engaged in music making. He describes the skilled musical performer's ability to play a piece unconsciously, which is behavioural or technique, not actually consciously thinking about every note, while simultaneously considering matters of large scale form, especially for instance in improvisation, and how the listener reacts viscerally to the sound that may be contemplate and may contemplate meaning from that. So we have this link between unconscious operation, the somatic level of, of embodiment and engagement in playing, and the abstract and the symbolic. Jeff Pressing, who unfortunately, Australian, who unfortunately passed away uh, some probably 10 years ago now, wrote also a great deal of very valuable material around this. And he says, playing an instrument causes the transfer of spatial and temporal information from the central nervous system to the system that physically produces the sound. Any such information transfer operates from within complex traditions of culture, musical design, and performance technique, and is shaped by human cognition, cognitive, and motor capacities. And we might think here about event speed, for instance, and Colin Nankaro's pieces that used to be unplayable, as well as, of course, our individual experiences, and how all of these things are adding to the dimensions of this problem space. It's incredibly complex. So if we come back to the original provocation, new interfaces do or perhaps don't equal musical expression, then we have to ask ourselves, well, what does that mean and is there a specific domain target? And yes, obviously we're all here because we're interested in making music. So how are these things musical? What are their affordances for musical activity? How are they culturally conditioned in terms of musical practice? So if I go and do a little bit of a word search and look at, again, coming back to ontologies, we can see here a word search looking at interface, and we can see here some of our key words, obviously. Technology, new instruments are still down here, music's here, research is here, and so on. If we look at music, or what is musical uh, in this context, again, we see a number of performance instruments, instrument here, Control is way out here. Expression is here, though. It is here, right? So it's an, it's assumed to be an essential part of musical uh, activity. Performance is interesting here because it divides up into a range of different areas. <coughs> asking about computers, and you can see this grouping here, composition, the interface, again, linking here to control and expression, both in this same domain, which is very interesting to me. And here about interfaces and new kinds of musical expression. When we ask about expressivity and musical expressivity, you can see here quite distinct groupings around performance, for instance, here around models and cognition and so on. And so in this community over the years, and in fact just in this conference, we've seen pretty much all of these kinds of interfaces being enacted. <coughs> we've, um, and we've seen discussion about commercial applications. So in recent years, there's been you know, major commercialization efforts that have built beautiful instruments like the Eigen Harp that are well built. They're built to tell you this is a serious instrument. Right? They're not something we pack together. They're beautiful things, come in a beautiful case, they feel amazing. This is a real instrument. However, from my perspective, the design is somewhat confused. When they come to tell us about the instrument, they tell us that it's a controller, that it can do all this controlling stuff. And then they tell us it's an instrument, that it can trigger all this stuff, but at the same time it can do all this amazing nuanced performance stuff, right? That it's the most expressive, as you'll see up there, their touchline, it's the most expressive electronic musical instrument ever made. Now I owned one of these for some time, because in the lab that I used to run in Sydney, we would buy these instruments so we could spend time with it, because how do you evaluate that by having one for a week or something? You can't possibly do that. But this multiple modes of simultaneous operation is of course part of a plan to meet a really broad community, right, commercial need, across a lot of genres, and to say, hey, we can, we can fit your need, whatever that happens to be. So they demonstrate holding it like a bassoon, holding it like a guitar, putting it on a table. It's everything for everybody, right? So where do I end up in that discourse? I end up going, I don't know what this is. 
I don't really understand what this really is at this point. It's a whole lot of things. Perhaps it's a controller, perhaps it's a finely new, nuanced instrument. I'm not sure. So then we look at others that have come out recently too. The Lindstrom, for instance, the Cuneo. Of course, Google has been doing this for a long time, right? And we think about multi-dimensional um, impact of performance. Now again, I think Roger Lee's making a mistake here. I think he's making a mistake because on one hand, he's often playing this thing lying on a table. On the other hand, he says, oh no, I can play it like a guitar and so on. Okay, so it might be something that we could do slightly different things with, but what? But then it leaves me asking, is it a controller, is it an instrument? Like, what is the actual application here? And I actually worked on this project, the Thumber project, some years ago for some time, and, and, and as a commercial imperative, they tried to do the same thing. They said, oh, this, this is its form. Right? This is what we designed for. And initially it had gyroscopes, accelerometers on it, and you could shake it and squirt, kind of squeeze it and do all kinds of, it was fabulous. And then they said, oh, well, you know, the commercial imperative, we have to actually take the accelerometers and, gy and gyros out because we can't afford it. And actually, maybe it's better if it's lying on a table for some people and they can use it like this, or they can play air guitar on a stick with it. And, and I just, again, it just died because nobody actually knew what it was. So this comes back to the question of idiomatic practice. How do we design instruments and how do we understand that instrument as a music making tool that as a community we want to engage with? So here we are getting down my list, my very um, enthusiastic list here. Um, and I just want to touch briefly on the question of evolution or revolution, uh, re no, whatever it is, <laughs> revolution, yes. Um, and, you know, point at a couple of other devices that are actually seem to be being very successful at entering the commercial market. The rolling keyboard, of course, is an evolution of currently known practice. You could say, hey, I play keys, I'm going to buy one of those and, you know, evolve my practice. The Harkin fingerboard, of course, is fantastically sophisticated and nuanced piece of equipment that's really very different to playing a set of keys. But a lot of people have bought these and are using them, again, to extend their musical language. So this is interesting because it's also, along with, you know, obviously Roger Lynn, who I have huge respect for, um, led to innovations such as MPE and, you know, new MIDI protocols to allow variations and evolutions of practice, MIDI protocol, right? Evolutions of practice that allow us to slowly evolve where we're going here. It's not trying to say, hey, here's an entirely new protocol, an entirely new paradigm. Pick it up, let's, or let's make that the main thing. Um, so then I ask myself, okay, so acoustic instruments still seem to be around, and they've been around for hundreds of years, and they seem to be extremely successful, and people still seem to like to play them, even though there are all these amazing interfaces. So what are the musical control parameters that make these instruments so successful? And back in, uh, I think it was 2007, uh, with my colleague Ian Stevenson at the University of Western Sydney, who's here somewhere, um, we undertook the Thumber Mapping Project because when I was asked to design mappings for this interface that I showed you, I said, well, we don't really know how to go about that. We don't really know what really works. And if we're going to commercialise this, we need to understand that better. So we went around and interviewed a large number of highly skilled professional musicians. And we asked them about physical controls on an acoustic instrument. And we also asked them about what were the musical parameters that they were controlling. Now, I then gave all of that information to somebody who wasn't a musician, didn't play music, but was an expert textual um, analysis person, and asked them to come back to me with models of what they saw in the text. So I tried to take the musical kind of um, intuitive guess out of that. And, and what came back was some very interesting things. Here's, for instance, a couple of quick maps, the violin, some of the control parameters that they're thinking about in terms of music, um, the flute map, various <coughs> things. You'll see that in each case, we're talking about pitch and tone control as being primary, uh, more complex one for double bass, looking at timbre and so on. So we came out of this with this set of musical parameters. So all of these people said to us, we just, you know, it was really was all of them when we, when we were boiled all the tape down, that dynamics, pitch, vibrato, articulation, and attack and release 
are the principal musical components that they're controlling and that the holy grail of all musical practice seems to be tone colour and within tone colour comes expressive intention. Um, and so then we went ahead and we looked inside each of those parameters, the musical parameters, to ask ourselves, well, what are the control parameters they bring to bear to generate that musical outcome? And you can see those analyses, some of those analyses here. Now, what, and this really surprised me, and I was really delighted at this point that I had given the data to somebody who wasn't a musician because I was surprised by this. They came back and basically said to me, you know, when we look down into each of those musical parameters, we actually find the same set of physical parameters. Everybody is talking about controlling those things, essentially <coughs> using pressure, speed, angle, and position. Right? And I went, wow, that's really useful. <laughs> that's really useful information. So why don't I just kind of go away and think about how does that work? Okay, at the time the Wii Mote was being like, everybody seemed to be using the Wii Mote to play music. And I was like, why does that fit? Why does that fit so well? Why are people using that? Why is there a massive uptake? <coughs> okay, and I went ahead and applied those things here. And then we of course went ahead and developed mappings for the thumber instrument that used those parameters pressure, speed, angle, and position. And I'd like to propose to the Nine community that that's a very good design framework to start from, right? If, every, if, if on the acoustic instruments, their principal physical characteristics that are being used, maybe we should seek to look at how do we transfer that and how do we consider the designs that we're coming up with in those contexts. The year after that, I came back to the Nine community and said, hey, we want to build a big database of all of the interfaces that you're engaging with and building, and we want to analyse those for, con for consistent approaches. In fact, we wanted to develop a taxonomy to see if there was a way of actually looking at categorising the kinds of practice that were going on. This website's still available. And it picked up a lot of attention. Wired wrote about it, CNN, it was on CNN, it was like all over the place. So people were really interested, it seemed, in the community in knowing about what were these paths of, of new development. Um, I worked with uh, Marcelo Vardley, Axel Mulder, Joel Chatterby and myself to gather this and to put <coughs> it together. And it was an attempt at an initial taxonomy, okay, a classification developed from comparative models of the submissions to the database. Now, it was not, of course, intended to be the end of the story, but the beginning of the story, to engage us all in discussion. And you'll see here some basic ideas that came up about whether we're building or making the material in real time and nuancing that, or controlling it and nuancing the control of it in various ways. And the way in which that seemed to lead down into two secondary categories, gestural or digital controller. And then as we go down further in the model from continuous to discrete, you'll see that all these things start to get very interlinked. Again, it's a highly dimensional space. So a simple taxonomy is obviously not a simple thing to build. And I would still love to have feedback on this and further iterations and, and thoughts about that. But in creation, we're really thinking about creation in the moment and the control of a morphology rather than the management of pre-made pre material here. Now some of the results that came out of that are interesting to look at too because we asked people about a number of questions and you'll see here, the lowest number is better, you'll see here that expression right, is way more important, way more important than anything else in this chart to everybody, way more important. So everybody in this community was saying, I'm building this because I want to express myself musically in some way. In addition to that, when we um, looked at these um, questions of whether it was an interface or an instrument, like how do they think about the combination of these things, you'll see here that there wasn't a huge difference. There's a bit of a difference, but not a huge difference, right? So this question of whether it's a real-time instrument of some kind or a control interface is not clearly um, defined there in the etymology. We also asked about control, um, the nature of control, and what really interested me was that we got these figures for those very same parameters that we looked at in acoustic instruments. So 80% of them said position was central to what they were doing. 67% said speed was really important um, control parameter. 
58% said they use pressure, importantly, and 48% said they use angle. So here, these same parameters that are in the acoustic instrument world are, in fact, being applied by us, often intuitively, in the interfaces that we're building. So these were ways of trying to get at this question of why do acoustic instruments persist and, you know, how do we actually think about building this out further into the nine community? And I want to suggest to you that part of why acoustic instruments continue to be so popular is because there are idiomatic bodies of literature for those instruments. For instance, those interfaces, let's say violin, flute, which I play, they don't do everything. They're not infinitely flexible. They're not really personalizable, right? And they're not unique. Okay, a flute is a flute. Okay, so I have a good flute and I've played really bad flutes, but a flute is still essentially a flute. That, they, that control and expression are not necessarily <coughs> the, des the design points that are put into that instrument at the very outset. And the affordances for expression in these instruments have a lot of noise in them, right? The difference between having a beginning flute and, a, and an expert flute is the expert flute is extremely unstable. It has a lot of noise in that control system. Now, as an expert player, that's fantastic because I can navigate you know, a tambour space in a really um, dynamic way. As a beginning player, that would be a complete nightmare. So it's interesting that there is a lot of noise in these highly developed instruments. So what's idiomatic then? Well, there's a shared technique. There's a common approaches to that. The shared performance practice. There's a known pedagogy, which puts all those things together. The body of literature for the instrument is shared. So we can all play whatever. Mary had a little lamb, or Beethoven's fifth, or whatever it is that we're involved with, right? There are therefore communities of practitioners, orchestras, bands, and ensembles, and so on. It has a substantial public take-up, okay? And there's a whole basic infrastructure for that. It's embedded, therefore, culturally, and, and seen to be culturally relevant, and therefore is historically robust. So these are really important things, in my view, for us to think about. Now, when I think about, well, what's idiomatic about the digital space in which I work, it's quite different to that. Of course, I'd like to see shared things, as I spoke about the Carlax and the Make Noise shared system, and I'd like to see growing pedagogy and shared models and so on. But for me, in the digital domain, you know, time has disappeared. We're now talking, you know, nanoseconds or something. It doesn't need to be composed. In the, system, in the pieces I compose, I no longer compose time. I compose sets of potentiality, sets of possible aesthetics, and I navigate those. Time is a product, in fact, of the performance outcome. The form is not afforded an, an affordance of the instrument. It could be indeterminate. There are minimal constraints in terms of speed of activation. It's not constrained by human capacity. And as I've said before, it is, in my view, an n-dimensional vector field. There's a kind of, we can think about designing performance works, even dance performance works, not as a linear time development, but as a just stop, as a singular experience of a work that we unfold over time as the performance. The scope has infinite morphology, and it's not fixed. Where, and, and then we can ask ourselves, where do we fix it in the hardware, in the algorithm, in the interface, etc. And it opens up new performance potentials in partnership with algorithms and non fixed <coughs> So, yes, so that's all those points. Um, <coughs> sorry, just got a bit behind myself on slides here. <coughs> okay, so the final point that I want to um, touch on then in thinking about all of these things is coming back to design. And in terms of design, we're often engaged heavily in technical constraints and in pushing technologies to achieve new expressions. And I've been thinking about this design idea and thinking, how do we turn this on its head? How do we stop thinking about mapping, but in fact just turn the entire question around? And over the last year, few years, I've been thinking a lot about the somatic experience of the way in which the instrument sits or engages with the body. I like this quote from Professor Robert Hatton, who says, musical gesture is biologically and culturally grounded in communicative human movement. 
gesture draws upon the close interaction and intermodality of a range of human perceptual and motor systems to synthesize the energetic shaping of motion through time into significant events with unique expressive force. When we think about picking up an instrument, any instrument, the first moment of interaction is gestural, right? We pick it up. It's a profoundly intuitive one, and it's a corporeal one. Then we, then we feel, how does the instrument fit our body, right? If we pick up any of the instruments that are shown here, a violin, a flute, or whatever, how does it fit the body? Is there an idiomatic a bit, um, kind of quality to that? Merleau, Point, Ponty and Donnie, as I pointed out earlier, talk about embodied relations. And in Eve's case, this is a unique set of relationships with technology that facilitate this embodied engagement with the world. And <clears throat> so what I wrote recently was this article in Organised Sound called The Technosomatic Dimension, in which I proposed that the connection between the human engagement with the interface, whether that's digital or analog, doesn't matter, and the resultant rich musical media output forms an experiential dimension that contains both technical and somatic considerations. And furthermore, that it has a materiality that you can feel that, and in fact, you can kind of quantify that in various ways. And in fact, that, that dimension should be one of our primary design evaluations. That the somatic relationship informs all the other technological constraints. Okay, the way the violin or the double bass sits on the body informs a lot about the technical constraints of that instrument. That such constraints do lead to an idiomatic language of that instrument. And we can think about the violin, the flute, or the harp, for instance. And that even extended techniques on those instruments don't break that relationship. Um, okay, sorry, forgetting to go ahead with my slides here. Um, <coughs> um, and in addition, that design and analysis efforts then for new interactive systems would benefit, in my view, from focusing on the technosomatic dimension, moving our attention from the hardware, from the sensing, from the software mapping, and thinking more about this space that exists between the physical body, the performer, and the interface. And if the dimension is designed with care and thought, then I suggest that it would produce a detailed and nuanced user experience. And that design specification that might come out of that technosomatic design process would include, uh, or would in fact in some ways automatically result, um, in desired materiality and actional intentionality with the instrument or the interface that we're actually designing. Um, okay, sorry, getting behind on my slides here. Okay, so basically I've tried to cover all of these points and I've ended here with thinking about where expression sits and the kind of, um, the, the subtle body engagement that we have with the interface and how that leads to um, a, large, a large dimensional space being a somatic gestalt. So in conclusion, I suggest that we draw on existing musical instrument design and consider the technical and cultural influences and in this case, I put forward these parameters, pressure, speed, angle, and position, as principal design characteristics for making musical interfaces and instruments. I also suggest that we prioritise thinking about the technosomatic connection, the space that's between the interface and the body, and our sensation of engaging with the musical instrument. I think that we need to be clear with others, as well as ourselves, about the complexity of the domain in developing appropriate evaluation tools. It's not simple, and we can't just adopt tools from science or humanities. And we need to consider generalizable idiomatic qualities, think about comparative frameworks, taxonomies, and so on, and use them to further express and evaluate the potential of nine, while still, of course, appreciating the power of constraints. And in my view, we need to seek to apply those principles outside our experimental practice in order to establish uh, or to utilise the incredible potential of this community outside our own domain. So, thank you very much.
instantly actually feel the guitar and us and the space between. And the space between seems the latent space for musical potential of that interaction. And, and I, I think we all feel it all the time, but we haven't focused on it. So, so my, my call to the community, I guess, is to, to, to kind of attend to that. And in terms of designing a new interface, to ask ourselves, what is the potentiality that we want in that space? So if that is a kind of latent space for the musical potential of engaging with that instrument, what, what is the range of that kind of musical outcome that we want, right? And then what is the, the kind of somatic sensation that we feel is, is, applies to that? Now, one of the things that I think is really interesting about that is coming back to that whole idea that, that you know, when we go to see a performance work, for instance, we come out with this singular kind of sensation of the work as a whole, this kind of just out that is the entire work, right? And, and we can pick that apart if we want to, but we have this kind of singular sensation of the entire event. And I think we actually do have that sensation when we engage with an interface as well. And so, but what we tend to do, because obviously it's still really difficult to do this, is that we tend to lay out the engineering problems, you know, we might say, I want to do this and make this thing do this and so on. And then we get involved in sensors and coding and all this sort of stuff. And then we end up with something as an outcome that is a combination of all of those things, which doesn't necessarily fit the body in a way that produces the kinds of outcomes that we actually would really have liked. Um, and I've been interested to see here at Nime a number of interfaces that I think are doing this actually, that are limiting their potential uh, ranges of use and are being very specific about that kind of nature of, of physical engagement and the kind of somatic relationship that develops to engage with it. So I guess the simple answer is I think we just need to start paying attention to it and think about the nature of that space and the things we want to build. I have a question. Thanks for this. Yep. Interesting presentation. Um, my question is I actually have two remarks. One question and one. Uh, my first question is why did the industry not put out controllers like the Carlux controller earlier? Why are they so rare? Why are they so expensive? Mm -hmm. It seems there's a high demand. Right. That was my question. Right. The other, the other thing that I wanted to remark is. Uh, something that I would like to see also considered in all of this discussion is the fact that we also want, we need to look at the score, the phenomenon, the notion of the score. Mm -hmm. Because that's a very important thing now that we have uh, a somewhat large notion of the score. Right. The instrument uh, could also work as a score, and there's a, a lot of work done in that area. Absolutely. And I would have loved to see more of that in being discussed by. Yeah, sure. Um, so I mentioned it very briefly early on about the work that Tom Mays and others are doing in terms of developing a scoring system for the Carlax specifically. Um, and, often, and obviously there is a range of other things like Sophie Smith at De Montfort um, read a PhD thesis on scoring for laptop orchestras and so on. So I agree with you, there's a lot of work. And, and, and it is fundamental to the discussion that I opened up about idiomatic practices and the way in which we share knowledge and build communities of practitioners and so on. Um, now, in terms of why are these things not more available, it, that's a really difficult question. And so I point to the Eigenharp here, for instance, which, as I say, is a beautifully engineered piece of kit. I mean, it's a really beautiful instrument. But it seems like they 
are too nervous to make it a particular thing, right? And so they make this kind of Max-like workbench to make it into anything you like. And in fact, they build it with a whole series of different things on it. And in the end, everybody's doing something else with it. So then you ask yourself, well, so what is the central thing here that can be shared? How do we build an Eigenheart community? And that doesn't seem to have happened, and they seem to be struggling with that. And I've seen that happen actually over and over again. So I think thinking about idiomatic practice is really important. How do we kind of make common practices that can be shared that do end up being scorable in whatever form that might be, and can be shared and do build communities, and then persist, in fact, past, you know, a pass from teacher to teacher and community to community and so on. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. I know you have to follow up, but I think we'll move on and leave your follow up with Poppy. Happy to talk to you. Yeah, there's some others just to get through. Yep. Um, thanks, Ken, for the talk. Um, so, you mentioned the importance of um, uh, an, an innovation kind of being maintainable and existing throughout time. Um, yes. Having a large pickup for different people. Sure. Um, <coughs> just to play a deal with that, okay. I wonder if you could talk about the kind of benefits of an instrument being short lived. Like, the kind of the other end of the spectrum mm -hmm. is live coding. So, mm -hmm. the, the, the thing that happens in a live coding performance only exists for that night. Sure. And it's great and it's really attractive. And yeah. Especially for like engineering, technical, and people. Um, so yeah, I wonder if you could talk about kind of good points of short-lived thinking. Yeah, sure. So the focus of my talk today was thinking about longevity <laughs> and 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 the efforts that are, are happening in terms of commercialization and and the very question that I've just been asked about why is it so difficult? Why don't you go down to the pub to to see a gig and just see people using alternative interfaces all the time? You just don't, right? I mean, you go to particular gigs where people do that, but it's not like every pub you go into. Somebody's using a contemporary interface. They're all using really old ones. Um, <clears throat> so that was the kind of core focus of what I was trying to get at. And you're right to point out that the reason this community exists is because there's incredibly dynamic experimentation going on. And that experimentation is not designed to have longevity. It's designed to learn stuff from and move on and build something else and, and evolve those practices. And as I say, in the years that I've been part of this community, I've seen that completely transformed from the <coughs> discussions that we had here. However, I also think it's dangerous if the focus of the community just becomes that, right? Because then I think that the potential that's within this community gets actually gets lost or just gets kind of siloed into itself. And, and I do believe strongly that there's a massive potential in this community to take music making more broadly beyond the places that we're at. In terms of live coding, of course, I would say, well, the framework you're using is the instrument. You know, um, Thor Magnuson has taken this up with me before and said, well, you know, I'm building an instrument here and it's really, you know, it has all these things. So, you know, I, I played analog synth on the first night too. And, you know, when I pull the cables out of that thing, it's back to nothing, right? It's, so it's, it's the potential to make music. And that framework is essentially um, the kind of framework that, that Andrew uses and has written um, it allows a whole range of potentials that are there in a way of working, and that is, in my view, the, the instrument of live coding. It's just that what you do with that on each night doesn't necessarily persist. If we just have time for one more question. So, so I've got a quick question. So the pub reference you just made, right? So, yep. So you do actually see, you know, like an Ableton controller rig in sure. a lot of pubs, right? Mm -hmm. So I've got a question. Why don't you see an Ewe in a pub? Like, Brantford, you know, it's not like we haven't had some very good instrumentalists play with yeah. EWEs over the years, sure. for example, but they've never really, you know, that the stuff just hasn't commercially worked out. Yeah, I know, I, and I, I've seen James Morrison play with EWEs. Yeah, like, <laughs> well, um, um, yeah, I know. I, look, I'm not sure. I owned a, a, the Yamaha version for some years, and it just kind of sucked. It, it just didn't, you know, you go back to playing an acoustic instrument, you just go, wow, the timbral possibilities here are so much more than what I'm getting out of this instrument. And I think that part of that is that we haven't, in commercialising those interfaces, we, we struggle with working out how we um, address this, this n-dimensional space that we're trying to work in, right? And we either constrain it like that, which is largely <coughs> for technological reasons when those things were developed, to a point where 
you can play a lot of notes, but you can't do a lot with those notes, really. Um, or to a point where we want to um, individualise everything and then we can't find out where that common core is. Um, so I think it's coming, and I think, I think you know, I was really excited to see the instrument and the rolling keyboard and things like that coming now with, with where the idea of multi-dimensional control is really starting to filter into the mass market. And I can see much more nuance coming in those instruments in, in the coming years. And what's really interesting about that is that the mass music market, the commercialised music and so on, will start using those tools. And so then those ideas will start filtering through the community in a much broader way. And then I think the work that we're doing will be more uptake. But yeah, I can't, I mean, why isn't the Eigenharp everywhere? I mean, it's a beautiful, beautifully built instrument. I think it has some contradictions in it, as I've said today, but it, it's really hard, it's really hard to crack that space. Yeah. Let's thank Garth again.